Good afternoon. If you are just joining us, we're going to wait a few minutes and let folks get logged on. Welcome to the Employee Forum Town Hall. We will start shortly. Once again, if you are just joining us, we're holding for just a minute while people get logged on. Welcome. I need to be assigned as captioner in order to provide closed captioning for this event. Great. Thank, Thank you, David. You're welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much. It's good to see you again, as always. Good to see you. If you are just joining us, we are just getting some technical things squared away and letting folks log on. We will be starting in just a minute. It's raining. Hi, everybody. Once again, we will get started in just a minute. Thank you for joining us today for the town hall. Hey everyone, we've received uh, the same question twice via chat, so it might be good to just let everyone know that you are um, in attendee mode, so you are on mute, um, and we'll give some more specifics later as to how you can share your questions and your thoughts. Right. We're going to hold for just about one more minute while people get logged on, and then we will get started. Welcome everybody. Okay, welcome everybody. This is the Healthy Return to Campus Employee Forum Town Hall. Welcome everybody and we are glad you're here. Approximately 15 months ago, we were all forced into a strange new reality. Without, without much notice, we made major shifts in the way we had to operate. Since then, some of us have been working out of our homes, some of us never left campus, and some of us have been experiencing a hybrid version of the two. Now we are faced with another major shift as people will be coming back together to begin to rebuild our in-person presence on campus. The delegates of the employee forum feel strongly that your thoughts and ideas should be incorporated in this transition. We have deliberately chosen a more traditional town hall format today where we are asking you to actively participate in the conversation. There is no panel of experts or anyone present to answer questions. 
we want to hear from you. To that end, the purpose of our town hall today is to give space for staff to share ways in which to achieve a healthy return to in-person working by inviting you to respond to four questions. The first, what are your thoughts or concerns about the university's return to campus plans for July and the fall semester? The second, what are some lessons learned from working through the pandemic? The third, how would you like to see lessons learned applied to the future? And last, what ways can we celebrate a return to campus and rebuild our in-person community? Today's meeting is being recorded and will be posted to our website so that it is accessible to those who are not able to attend. Additionally, the ideas discussed today will be included in a written report provided to administration. The report will also incorporate your responses from the survey we sent out with the link to register to this event. We will try to get to as many people as we can today. If you are unable to share your thoughts with us during this meeting, please be sure to complete the survey. Some procedures to note during the meeting today. We have disabled the chat and are relying on the Q&A feature and the raise your hand feature. If you wish to remain anonymous, you can choose the anonymous option in the Q&A. If you wish to display your name in the Q&A, that option is also available. Please note that things posted in the Q&A are visible to all participants and attendees. Again, please do not pose questions in the Q&A as we have no panelists, but rather share your ideas or concerns with us so that may we, we may incorporate them into the report. If you would like to be recognized and share your thoughts or concerns on camera, please use the raise your hand feature and you will be invited to speak. In order to facilitate the conversation, we, has, we have asked University Ombuds Don Osborne Adams to guide our conversation. She will be joined by several delegates to help with the technology required to make today's event happen. The delegates helping today are Keith Hines, Jacob Womack, Laura Pratt, Katie Musgrove, Stephanie Foreman, Kevin Robinson, Tiffany Carver, and Ellie Alexander. And with that, I give you Don Osborne Adams. Thank you, Shana. And welcome everyone. I can't see all of you, but welcome. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my role and the space and how I want everyone to think about what we're gonna do here today. It is my pleasure and it's an honor really to be here. We're at this next historic you know, transition point for campus. And I feel privileged to be able to play even some small part in helping the staff on this campus contribute their voices um, to this transition point. So I said something about roles. Clarity about roles is really important because without it, everyone's gonna be you know, throwing virtual tomatoes at me by the end of the meeting. So I want us to all be on the same page about what it is that I'm doing here. And so think of this meeting as a big container, like a big sturdy container. It can hold anything that anybody wants to put in it, absolutely anything. And so my job is to help get information into that container. And it's whatever information you want to provide, hopes, fears, excitement, frustration, needs, concerns, questions, whatever it is, throw them in and the employee form will make sense of it once it's all in there. So what we need from you is we need you to participate. There is very little, I will say, from the role that I'm in that is as compelling as a person speaking honestly about what is most important to them. And Shana said, there are no experts here. There's no panel of experts, but I'm gonna say we have almost 500 experts in this meeting. And what you're experts about is your own experience. And so know that and lean into that, that you know the most about what you need and what you've experienced and we wanna hear it from you. There are people who are here to participate. There are also lots of people listening and I'm sure there's university administrators listening. Hi administrators. And it's important for everybody to hear what you have to say, because this is a matter of, I think, the mind and the heart. And so we need to bring it all to the fore. There's a lot of diversity among us. And part of that diversity is around comfort speaking and you know, speaking in a big meeting, speaking in a recorded meeting, there will be some people for whom it will be very easy to just kind of step to the mic and open up. There are other people for whom it will be a challenge. And so everyone also know that 
if you do challenge yourself to speak, there's at least one person who will not speak who will be grateful to you for saying exactly what they were thinking. So we are gonna move along. Um, my ask from you, so that's about my role. My ask from you is that you be as generous and have as much grace with all of us and with me as possible. If I get your name wrong when I call your name, please correct me because only then will I have an opportunity to get it right the next time. Let me see, what else do I wanna say? Um, I'm gonna call on speakers. I'm gonna try and make sure that people know who's on deck so that you'll have a little bit of time to prepare, but it's gonna be a bit of a group effort if I miss somebody, um, the delegates here will help me. There's a lot of improvisation that comes with an event like this. So we're all, none of us know what's gonna happen and we're all improvising a little bit and you'll see that. Um, and that's part of the community feel of this. But you're in luck because I have a very high tolerance for uncertainty. So my final thing that I'm going to say is that we're all here um, kind of in this together and we are all going to be better and we're all going to learn from whatever is shared today and our campus is going to be better from whatever we share today. One of my favorite quotes is by Mary Parker Follett and is that all polishing is done by friction. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to polish. So let's start with the first question. So the employee forum leadership worked very hard on this event. I also want to say that spent a lot of time trying to come up with a format and with questions that would be big enough to allow the wide diversity of staff to speak into them. And so the first question is, what are your thoughts or concerns about the university's return to campus plans for July and the fall semester? It is literally the question that says, please tell us what's on your mind. It's hard to be the first person to speak. So we'll wait to see if somebody will volunteer to speak. Wonderful. So Charlene Ryan. Is there something I need to do to enable Charlene to speak? I believe you hear me now. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm concerned about riding the bus and having asthma. How safe is it to ride the bus? So that's not something that we have an answer for, but I, we appreciate you raising that concern. And so anything that's asked as a question, I'm going to say to the delegates, that should be noted as something that people need more information about. And I see heads shaking. So that question and that concern will be noted. And also, Charlene, just for you, I just have to, um, oh, I don't have my reactions. I wanted to give you a little celebration reaction. Thank you so much for being willing to be the first person to speak. George Heath and then Kathy Gordon. Hi, can you guys hear me? We sure can. There we are. Okay, sorry. Uh, Zoom kind of did a, a rejoining situation. Um, I wanted to first thank you guys for the opportunity to speak about this stuff today, Dawn and everyone. Um, I know that my response to this question was very firm, uh, just because I'm, I'm pretty incensed by it. Um, I don't understand the university's push to move people into the office five days out of the week. And I think it's a bit... I mean, I wrote that I thought this decision was ignorant, unethical, and unjustified for various reasons, considering the fact that we've been working from home for over a year at this point. Um, we haven't had any lapses in productivity, notably in our office. And the reasons for coming back, I feel, should be up to individual offices that know their own operational needs. You know, to tell employees now, after they've been doing a tremendous job of working from home and keeping this university running, they have to go into the office 
nine hours a day, you know, with an hour break in between, wear a mask, be socially distanced to prevent the spread of COVID-19, still have Zoom meetings. I mean, this is all stuff that can be done from home and not to mention they have to commute and pay for parking. So I don't, I'm just, I'm very perplexed by why this decision is being made. I think there were some people in the Q&A too that kind of echoed these same sentiments. Like who is making this decision? Why is it five days out of the week? Why is there such inflexibility in something that should be flexible? And, you know, the lack of transparency, which, I mean, there was a lack of transparency in that report too from 2020. People, employees were feeling that there wasn't transparency from leadership as to why certain decisions were being made. I don't know, you know, I, I feel like administrators are kowtowing down to like some uh, reason for this push that isn't being transparent, you know, for all of us that work at this university. So it feels like a slap in the face, <laughs> uh, considering everything that's gone on. So thank you, George, for speaking so honestly. And I hear a real desire for more information and for more explanation that will resonate with you um, about the choices being made. I also hear the question about who's making the decisions. Thank you. Next, we'll have Kathy Gordon and then Julie Theralt. Kathy? Can you hear me now? We sure can. Great, thank Hi, you. Kathy. Hi, everyone. My concern is um, still with the first young lady's question. Um, I understand that you can't speak to it directly, but let me say that all bus systems into the university is not created equal. I live in Mebbin. I, with a number of coworkers, we use the park bus, it's the red and black bus. They have been so inconsistent with transportation that I had to switch from the bus to driving in on campus, which is an extra expense that, you know, I did not want to do, which is more crowding, overcrowding. And so if there's any way that the university, when they make these contracts and these agreements with these services, if they can speak to them and get them to hire drivers that will not fall asleep or drivers who will keep to the schedule, that is what we need. Um, the university has to have some input into this because it's the university employees, staff and faculty and students that are using the bus service. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, can I ask you a follow up question? Yes. Okay, so I, um, of course I do wanna know more about these drivers that are falling asleep, um, but I'm gonna to try to stick to, stick to the other pieces of it. Um, I hear you talking about the quality of the drivers, the consistency of the transportation and cost. Are those the three main ideas? Cost is not an issue because we have a card or we can use an app on our phone, wave it and you know there is no cost to us. But I had to switch to, like I said, driving on campus and then in the fall switch to um, Chapel Hill Transit, which is more out of my way, more driving for myself. And if we're trying to be you know, more conscientious and love on mother earth, then we need for the agreements that the university has made with the, these um, bus services for them to take some ownership and say to them, look, our employees are complaining. We will, and, and this happened to me personally, I called the um, part bus to customer service and asked them why the the bus was not coming. I had the app. I could clearly see that the bus was at the stop. And he said, there's no bus there. I'm like, sir, yes, it is. But nevertheless, you know, what's going on? The bus is late. And he said, oh, yes, um, that's another bus for another route. The bus is late and it's on its way. Just, I mean, 
flat out untruth, flat out untruth, and you can't get any information out, out of them. They won't tell you the truth. Understood. So big umbrella of quality of services as it relates big. to bus transportation. transportation huge, on huge. So much so to, I am really concerned when persons come back and start riding because it's a popular bus. Thank you, Kathy. And so I Thank see you. the delegates nodding their heads. I'm sure that they're, they're recording this as well. So I yes. think we had a name drop off. Next up is, Ju I'm going to say Judith no, and then she's, Marnie. It's still Julie. I just went, oh, ahead, and, I went ahead and moved her up so oh. to a panelist so she could talk oh, okay. um, to cut down on the delay before. Um, Got it. Between. So while Julie is talking, I will um, go ahead and move Judith and do it so there's not the delay that we have been having. That's great. We're getting our act together. Okay, Julie. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I have a clarifying question about the required return to campus that um, may or may not address additional concerns. <clears throat> is it, it's my understanding that it is a required return to campus for staff. However, um, non-teaching faculty can still work remote. Is that true? So I don't, I don't know the answers to anything. So this is in the rotten tomato field. Like don't throw rotten tomatoes at me. I don't know the answer to anything, but our delegates will record that as something that is not clear. Right okay, now. so my, my concern with that would just be the equitable piece of roles. Um, and so looking, when we're talking about a return to campus, making sure that all returning to campus are held to the same standard. So if all staff are required to return to campus five days a week, I would hope that that would also be true for faculty and that faculty do not get a pass if they are not teaching or something like that because they hold a different role. Because to me, that shows preferential treatment over our faculty instead of staff. Thank you. So concerns about faculty and staff and equitable treatment. Yes. Thank you. So next we have Judith. Thank you. Um, I think my question is similar to Julie, the last speaker. Um, I know for me, I was hired recently with clear understanding that I had no intention of relocating. Um, and with knowing that now everybody is saying like, okay, we're returning back to the office. So I'm, I guess I'm trying to get clarification for like the School of Medicine. Um, is that like everyone and what happens to the staff that were hired with no intent of relocating that's been working remotely? Okay, thank you. So who do, who do the rules apply to again? And then this sub question of, um, of relocation if I was hired with an understanding that I would not relocate. Yes. Thank you. So Keith, you're gonna have to tell me who's next. Next up, we're gonna have Marnie. Okay, Marnie is next. Yes. Marnie? And then Roger. Hey, can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Um, hello, and yes, thank you for having this forum. Um, so, you know, I wanted, you know, obviously this is more about making statements about, you know, our thoughts and how we feel about everything. And I submitted some questions thinking that maybe we would have some answers, but it seems like this is just more like to let you know how the employees are feeling. And to echo what George said, and I'm sure several other people feel, yeah, I mean, it seemed it to, to all of us who actually have to be here every day, um, I've been coming into work since last July, maybe once or twice a week. Um, most of our office has been remote and we've done a fantastic job. Um, and it, it really, um, I feel like the whole question about lessons learned, I don't feel like UNC has learned any lessons because it's obvious that not every position requires an on-campus, but you know, forward facing. And to what Julie said, I don't see it as like, okay, so if one person gets this, everyone needs it. I think it should be left up to the departments 
to figure out each position, what it, you know, what that position entails. If we need to rewrite position descriptions, like let's not go backwards. You know, we've, we have found that there is a very, like there is an issue with a, like a work to life balance. I mean, let's look at it from an economic standpoint. Most people cannot afford to work, like who, who work at this university cannot afford to live in Chapel Hill. So all of us are pretty much commuting. So like, let's, let's take these things into consideration. Why are we wanting to increase traffic? We don't have enough parking for people who do want to come on campus. And when we do, we charge kind of a little bit of an outrageous amount for that parking. Why go back to a model that is not serving us when we have shown that we can serve our constituents without having to be in the office every day? It's to me, it's taking into no account the, the, all the brilliant minds that we have here. Let's figure out a way to operationalize having an on campus presence in a way that makes sense and is progressive thinking. Because right now we are going backwards. We're going backwards for the environment. We're going backwards to the, the health and well being of our employees. People still have kids at home. People are dealing with sick family members. I mean, you're, it's, it's just so heavy handed. And I mean, it honestly, like so many of us are so incensed. People are going to quit. People are going to leave. If they haven't already, they're going to be looking for new jobs. We are going to lose really talented people because the university, whoever's making these decisions, who I don't know who's making these decisions because I mean, no one that I've talked to has thought that this is a good idea. So the fact that that this is so heavy handed coming from a power that be that we have no idea why this is the, the message that's coming across other than we don't trust you. You're going to come back to work. We're going to go back into this, you know, like revolutionary or the, um, sorry, the industrial period where everyone has to clock in and clock out and we're going to micromanage you to the nth degree. And it is just terrible. So we're going to lose good people. So Marnie, thank you for giving us, you know, a kind of vantage point into what this feels like for you and the people around you and also some sense of what, um, you know, what you think a possible outcome could be. Um, thank you. And for speaking so honestly. No, I just think there should be flexibility. There should be the, of the individual department heads and managers. I, I just, I think that the fact that the, the flexibility and the like letting letting the, the people who are on the ground, you know, make decisions that are best for everybody, not just the powers that be, you know, it needs to be con considered because right now we're not being heard and we're not being no one's taking any anything to, that has to do with us in the consideration. <laughs> Thank you. So next we are going to move I think Roger. Yes, hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Good. Good. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Um, so I, I have a few things. Um, you know, we've mentioned the environment. I think that's an important thing. We had how many thousands of people not commuting, and we think of the greenhouse effects that had. We reduced UNC's footprint. And in one day, the university wants to completely undo that in one day. That's one thing. Two, we are bending over backwards to accommodate students in all their needs. There is no accommodations here for, for, fac, student, for faculty and staff, none. It just once again reiterates how this university treats its staff. Why are there no accommodations? Two, three, and this has been mentioned, deans, managers have effectively run this university in their departments for 15, 16 months, what they're saying to those deans and managers are, we don't trust you anymore. If they trusted them for 15 months to open this, keep this university running, why are they not saying, we trust you to manage your offices when we return back in the fall? It's a slap in the face. And lastly, many offices had, before COVID, telecommuting, tele remote working policies. Once again, why are we moving backwards and we're saying even those are invalid? If we're coming back to campus, then let's come back to campus like we did pre-COVID and allow those policies. This is once again, I think as others have said, the university has no consideration for faculty and staff, none. By requiring this and not providing any flexibility whatsoever, it is really saying to faculty and staff, we don't care about you, 
and we don't care about what happens to your health and the health of your families. So thank you, Roger. Environment, accommodations, remote working policies, and showing value for faculty and staff is what I hear from you. And thank you for all the questions. Again, delegates, I think questions indicate a need for more information. Thank you, Roger. Next, we have Ken and then Jessica. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, entertaining my uh, comments, questions, concerns. So I work in the School of Medicine, um, as someone else mentioned earlier. Um, the School of Medicine is one of these pilot groups that you may see mentioned in terms of it, it moving forward with a different approach. So if the university at, at large is doing a 100% return to campus in July sometime, the School of Medicine has gone with a completely different approach, which is um, September 7th, we're beginning our new what terms called working forward, where people are being assigned work types based upon their position description and analysis of HR and only impacting SHRA and EHRA non-faculty positions. But my concern is that this approach is, is perhaps um, not employee-centered enough. It's very organizationally centered. Um, the way this works is that analysis is done, you are given an assignment, there's some business reasons you can, you can say, hey, I don't want to be 100% remote, I need to be hybrid, or if I'm hybrid, I need to be 100% remote, or you can be on site, whatever it happens to be. Um, but what's not part of that approach is um, any thought about how to help people equip their home offices to be ergonomic and productive to think about the differences in benefits, how that impacts people. There are benefits that you, they're easier for you to access if you're on site than if you were on the remote. Um, and so what I, the reason why I joined this is to raise some awareness and ask that the employee forum be engaged in helping advocate for some equity or some process development for those employees that are already moving forward to this. Um, when I say it's not employee centric, many of you have, have advocated for, hey, I find I'm more productive as X way. That was not part of the process for assignment of roles. It was a review of the position description um, and an HR folks um, made a decision as to your assignment. There are some process for EEOC for those that need an accommodation. There's some business process you can appeal to the committee based upon your work work roles, and, uh, but I don't know that there is uh, a lot of structure around this uh, moving forwards. Uh, and I, I don't know how else to, to, to figure this out. It would be more comfortable to help people, um, those who find um, their work assignment not as, do not believe the work assignment would be as productive as they were in their, in their preferred methodology. Thank you. So Ken, you've said it perfectly. Um, I think I understand employee centered process is one part and the other is if you are working at home, what are the additional implications to working that, at home? I believe that's reasonably correct. Um, I think there may be um, some pressures driving the decision in terms of um, assigning people uh, work locations. Um, a comment was made in the slide deck that we were provided that it would be um, help preserve capital because they'd be uh, shutting down external office leases. Um, for the School of Medicine in reserving spaces on campus for revenue generating programs. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a, probably a goal that's part of this effort within the school. Um, and it seems organizationally centered versus employee centered. Um, and when asked uh, about whether or not they would be stipend, because you're shifting work to people's homes permanently to help them have an effective office, have you know, do you need to upgrade your internet service provider or whatever? I mean, I know we've been doing this, but it's not necessarily in, in extremists. We're not in extremists anymore. We're coming back to normal work. Um, there was not a lot of traction around that concept um, in the presentations that I've seen. And I would prefer that the employee forum analyze this and come up with a stance for how people who are either on site, hybrid, or remote um, should be supported by this university. Understood. These comments, I would imagine, are very, very helpful to the forum. I believe that next we have Jessica and then Megan and then Dennis. Is that correct, Keith? We Jessica is next. Um, I think 
Megan lowered her hand, but we do have Dennis after that. Okay, so Jessica and then Dennis. Hey there, I'm Jessica. Hi, um, Jessica. I would like to echo one of the points that Roger made, which is that um, the, the guidance that we have so far from the university seems to create a reality for employees that is more severe than the working arrangements we had prior to the pandemic um, with tighter work schedules, 100% um, of time in the office on campus, which seems to ignore any arrangements that employees had made with their managers prior to the pandemic for flexible work locations and flexible work schedules, which is creating an undue burden, um, in my opinion, for, for people. Okay, and so what I hear from you is maintaining some of the flexibility that existed before the pandemic is important to you. At a minimum. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah, absolutely, at a minimum. And I, I would like to echo also what others have said that we have, um, certainly we have proven our ability to have even more flexibility over the last few months. Yep. Got it. Thank you, Jessica. So next is Dennis. And then once we hear from Dennis, I want to just take a moment and see, Shana, whether you want to talk a little bit about what's in the Q&A. Dennis? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for having this forum. And, and I hope that um, I can uh, echo some of what we've heard already without repeating. Um, I think it's important to note um, the the pride in the UNC system in um, not only providing world-class uh, health care, but also education. Um, it's absolutely a wonderful organization to belong to. And I think that pride was um, demonstrated uh, in response to the pandemic by the entire campus shifting to an off-campus in order to maintain uh, as best as we could. Um, now that leadership has uh, expressed an interest in having a campus presence return, um, that needs to be taken in consideration with some additional um, cost expense, uh, not only to physical plant improvements, uh, ventilation systems, circulation systems, and so on, but also um, in a consideration for physical space, since space was limited prior to the pandemic, now with social distancing requirements, things like restrooms, uh, sanitization, and, and so on and so forth, it, it would have to be increased um, because that is one of the lessons we learned from the pandemic. Um, that being said, if that cost is going to be invested, um, then we also have to consider the costs in salary to the staff and, and, and so on because the expectation is there's also an increase in parking, and so on and so forth. So in order for those employees who are returning to campus, there has to be some kind of compensation to be able to cover the necessary expenses that wouldn't be related to a work from home scenario. Um, that being the case, um, there's, a, there's an expectation there. Um, it has been mentioned already that that one day shift uh, may not be uh, a, a good solution, but maybe a transition over a period of time, which includes all of the other opportunities, knowing full well that there is going to be a transition and that transition needs to be met with the lessons that we have learned and, and the various um, needs as we go forward. Um, if there's a recommendation to be made, maybe looking at campus as being a supplemental uh, to the uh, on, online learning and the online healthcare options, um, and that supplement being in a small group scenario and or in a lab scenario and so on and so forth, where um, you know, we can accommodate the, the current need based on what we've learned during the pandemic. Thank you. So I don't think that was duplicative and you definitely added the additional question of, of transition over time and what that might what that might look like. But I hear you highlighting the practical pieces of physical plant space, physical distancing, how that will work and also what the cost will be to staff. So thank you very much, Dennis. You're welcome. Shana, do, is there anything you I, I can't see it. So I don't know if there's anything you want to jump in and say at this point or do you want to keep moving? 
Well, we do have 99 uh, questions in the or comments in the Q and A, and um, some of them have been upvoted quite a bit. So I wanted to give some space for the delegates who are helping with the Q and A portion to to share some of those. Oh, that's right. I got it wrong. I'm supposed. I think Stephanie, it's you. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Thank you, Shana. Um, so. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Foreman. I am a delegate with the Employee Forum, and I am uh, joining Dawn to highlight some of the um, comments and thoughts that you guys have put into the Q&A. Um, there are a lot of them, so I'm going to really focus on the ones that have been upvoted uh, the most. Um, so I know everyone uh, online can see the Q&A, but for folks who are joining us over the phone, um, I want to highlight and read um, the first few. So the one that's been upvoted 85 times um, says, the flexibility of working a hybrid schedule greatly increased my quality of life. The ability to help my spouse with child activities, getting dinner on the table at a decent hour, and spending more time with my kids has been a great experience. Why weren't employees surveyed about what kind of schedule people would like? My department just issued a decree that everyone must be back nine to five every day. And it is extremely frustrating that there was not more communication. And the next one, nope. Um, why is the university requiring a rigorous process to test if employees can work remotely if we all had a rigorous test of working remotely for the past year and a half? We've worked with kids at home. We worked with family members that have been sick with COVID or died. And the university is requiring that we return with no options of working remotely. Who is making that decision and why is it a requirement? Um, and the last, well, the third one uh, that I'll read out is, I feel that we haven't learned anything over the last 16 months. We've worked successfully from home and understand there are some jobs that must be on campus, but others can continue to be done remotely. We seem to be going back to be inflexible rather than taking the lessons learned. Um, and so I, I'm sure Dawn will add to this, but uh, I will say as someone who is also reading through your survey responses um, that the sentiments that have been expressed through the Q&A and through the three that I just read uh, have been kind of widely echoed, um, things about work-life balance, flexibility, um, and the feeling that we've already uh, proved that we can work remotely. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Dawn, uh, but continue to, to use the Q&A and, and upvote what you think uh, should be read broadly. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and the, the thing that I'll add is it's good when themes emerge because they give people who need to provide more information or address questions that haven't been addressed an idea of what's on everybody's mind. So to my um, feeling, the fact that there's similar threads and themes, this event is working in exactly the way that it should. Remember, we're polishing. So that last statement that you made is the perfect segue to the next question, which is what are some lessons learned from working through the pandemic? And these can be organizational lessons, they can be individual lessons, unit lessons, you know, interpret it that whatever way that you want, we wanna hear uh, what your thoughts are on this. So I have Lisa Zerdin and then Ken Langley and then George Heath. I think that was an error. I don't have a question, excuse me. Oh, okay. So we have Ken and George. What are some lessons learned working through the pandemic? Hi, um, I'm sorry to, to weigh in again. Uh, just FYI, I sit on the policy review committee um, with Jen Daniel. Um, Jen, I forgot your last name, I apologize. Um, we just reviewed for Office of HR a flexible work arrangement policy that's going through review cycle. Um, and it would be interesting to have the employee form review that and help provide some guidance. The biggest change, there have been a lot of comments about teleworking. Uh, any of the biggest change of policy that I could detect is that now for teleworking arrangements lasting more than 30 days, they, they have to be in compliance with the major campus unit plan. So this may be a vehicle for people to take their lessons learned and advise their unit in building the plan to help them do uh, hybrid or remote work as needed. And that would be how I would comment on that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ken. No need to ever apologize for speaking. I think that's an important practical um, next step that you pointed out, or next step suggestion that you pointed out. I think next we have George. Hi again. Hi um, again. Yes, there we are. Um, yeah, uh, I think what we've learned is that there's no operational need, at least in our office, specific to where I work. We don't need to have five days in the office to do our jobs. Um, I think any kind of flexible working policy makes sense at this point. And to go back to a five day, I, I mean, it, it shows that the university hasn't actually learned a lesson. It shows that, you know, all of its employees now know that they could have a more flexible life that the university is now denying to them. I just don't think it's a good, uh, if, if we've truly learned lessons, we would adapt to a more flexible policy. You know, we would make, we would make, we would allow departments to make these decisions themselves. The thing that really kind of bothers me too about some of, and, and this isn't, I don't think UNC uses this language, but I've seen a lot of language from uh, corporations saying return to work and that doesn't exist. We've been working this entire time. Um, I think that kind of goes in line with a lot of toxic positivity uh, in, in workplaces where they say, well, you know, everyone's gonna come back and it's gonna be this great thing. And it's like, well, we have been working. And if there's any lesson we've learned, it's that we don't have to have a five day a week presence on campus to do our jobs. Um, so that's, so, that's all I'd like to say. Yep, I hear you say, I don't, that you don't see the lessons having been learned, but the lesson you believe has been taught is that five days isn't necessary. And then you also, um, are paying attention to language. And so I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to mm -hmm. ask you this. What what language would you prefer? Because there's been a lot of talk about what's the right way to talk about this because they're, everyone's positioned so differently and has been working. Everyone's been working the whole time in different places. What would you use? Um, I, uh, I would probably have to be refined, but I think, you know, there's been talk throughout this entire pandemic of a new normal. I think that's what we're shifting to. We're learning that the ways of uh, working pre-pandemic are not necessary anymore. Um, so I don't think any sort of language that uses return is going to be the best thing that gets people excited to go back into work. We're truly in a new phase of, uh, phase of life, I think at this point. Thank you for that. That's a helpful, helpful clarifier. Of course, thanks Don. Thank you, George. All right, Megan Kraft is next. Hi, everyone. Hi. Sorry, I haven't ever gotten on one of these before and I thought it kicked me out for a minute. Um, okay. So I am one of the assistant directors for Lineberger, which is a pretty big department here in the School of Medicine. And I know Ken's kind of been talking and he is, you know, higher level in School of Medicine IT. And I, I just want to speak from some of the people in our area. Obviously, I can't speak for everybody, but we are really listening to the voices of our faculty and staff on what what School of Medicine is calling is working forward. And, you know, that for us has been, I think a really good, uh, we kind of did a listening tour. We talked to all the different staff members in, we've got everything from lab personnel to administrative personnel to accountants pre-award. I mean, we've kind of got the full scope within our department. And I think that the School of Medicine has been working really hard to listen as well and communicate as much as possible. Again, I can't speak for all departments and I've found the longer I've worked for UNC, we all silo ourselves in some ways. But I do wanna say that there are definitely um, thoughts out there that we can work towards something new and something better that works for everyone. I know I've appreciated the work-life balance. I've got a toddler at home that I've got to enjoy watching grow as a director, you don't tend to be home often. so. That was really nice. Um, I do know that, you know, there are ways that we can be better with this. We have proven our efficiency and effectiveness over the last, you know, 13, 14 months. Uh, I know that the beginning was hard, even for me trying to figure out that work from home structure, but, you know, it gives us more flexibility, more freedom. It gives us a wealth of knowledge, both internally and externally. And I don't know if you guys have felt the effects of this as much as I have, but in the last you know months of COVID, it's become clear that a lot of people are moving to a work from home structure indefinitely, and that creates you know another 
difficult hurdle for us to retain employees when we already don't really pay the best. And so if we can't become competitive in this job market, especially as Google comes and Apple comes and all these other huge companies are coming to an already competitive area, you know, we need to think smarter and more strategically on how we can create better well-being for our staff while also still, you know, giving the service that's needed. I have noticed effects of not being on campus. Um, I'm not saying that means we need to be here all the time, but there are definitely things, at least in our department, that we have seen fall because we have not had, you know, continued staff on site. So I think just, you know, figuring out where our faults are and how to kind of plug those holes while continuing to provide the, you know, customer service that we have been is the most critical piece. I will say that the School of Medicine and the university have had competing conversations on how this happens. So it has been a little confusing for us internally of, who are we following? What are we doing? What is our message that we want to present? Um, but I do think that they're trying as hard as they can, um, some a little more than others, to try to listen. And I wanted to come and hear your thoughts too. As I said, we're kind of doing a listening tour, so it's interesting to hear everybody's feedback, you know, internally and externally, as far as our area about what people are doing. So, from my level, I appreciate all of y'all being here and. Um, thank you for letting us know how you feel. And we appreciate you, Megan. Thank you for giving us a little vantage point into your work life and also into your home life with your toddler um, and highlighting something that you feel maybe is imperfect, but also is working. I think this is such a complex and huge place that the scale of it, um, you know, really keeps us from being able to see into different units and what's working, even if it's a work in progress. So that's mm -hmm. appreciated. And for you also highlighting what polishing needs to be done. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay, we have a couple more hands. Brenda Carpen and Dennis um, Pelletier, I'm gonna say, but Dennis, you're gonna correct me when you come on. So Brenda, let's start with you. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. I'm, I'm calling from the phone. So thank you um, for this opportunity to, to talk about uh, return to campus, return to work, and um, the lessons learned. So one of the things that um, I did want to mention is, and one of the lessons that I've learned is, I think I have been even more productive and my colleagues have been even more productive working remotely, especially when it comes to meetings. We've been able to do meetings via Zoom um, that we don't have to travel to. And especially when we have such a diverse participant, crowds in, uh, sorry, of a, a d diverse crowd of people, um, participants in our meetings, it's allowed us to have these meetings um, that when you take travel time in because people are located across the university. Um, we've cut down on that travel time. We can have the meeting on Zoom. Um, and, you know, potentially a two hour meeting is reduced to a 50 minute meeting because we can just get on Zoom. We can discuss what we need to discuss and then everybody can go back to um, what they're doing. And, and so I think that gets lost in the shuffle. You know, um, we, we talk about you know, we know we've all been working, we've been working really hard, but we've, I feel in certain areas, we've been even more effective because we've had tools that enable us to connect better than we could in person. And I also believe it's actually more accessible. You know, um, we're provide. you know, um, having online meetings. I, I don't know what your participant count is for today's meeting, but if you thought about doing a similar kind of meeting in person, you probably, you know, won't have had as large a group of people participating um, if this meeting was not uh, virtual. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I think we have about 500 people close to, and I hear you giving a shout out to the technology as accessible and creating more accessibility and also efficiency. So thank you for bringing in those ideas. And next we have Dennis. 
I'm uh, enthusiastic about the responses that we've heard so far. It's absolutely overwhelming to feel similar as the voices that have already spoken. Um, just to kind of capitalize on that, um, since the question right now is uh, how can we uh, apply those lessons, I think it's appropriate to migrate the from question, a, The question now is lessons. What are the lessons? And then we'll get to applying them. Right, right. So okay. so looking, looking at the lessons, I think the lesson learned is in, in transitioning back to campus, I think the lesson learned is that there needs to be some differences now. And those differences uh, can be addressed if we migrate from a listening perspective and, and move into an addressing perspective. Um, hearing the lessons is one thing, but then being able to actually act upon that and address some of those lessons learned is critical. We can't just um, you know, block that out. Uh, by doing that, we need to have the compassion in the listening process to be able to understand how to be able to approach that work forward possibility. Um, we've got to come up with creative solutions um, that allows us to be able to uh, answer that compassion by brainstorming rather than focusing on the barriers that might prevent those options. So I think it's, it's critical, um, you know, I mentioned finances before, but now we need to, uh, in the lessons that we've learned, you know, there's been a lot of discussion already about um, being able to work remotely, offering options, looking for new ideas, either through technology or through um, opportunities uh, to be able to include in other ways. Uh, being competitive and so on and so forth, having that compassion to be able to take those lessons learned and actually act upon them, I think is critical rather than just uh, focusing on the barriers and saying, well, that's not the way we've always done it. So we can't do it that way. Thank you, Dennis. So you're, you're making a call to action yes, and please. highlighting, let's focus on possibilities. Com compassion. And compassion. Yeah, I think the compassion is going to be in, 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 it really the most key factor because that's what's going to allow the creative solutions to come forward in the, in the action process. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. And so I saw another hand up. It's not here anymore, but I believe the name was Hala. Oh, there it is. Hey, can you hear me? Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, hi. Uh, yeah, um, first thing I need to really appreciate this meeting and uh, uh, we're really happy because this is the uh, like a best thing to show how the virtual it's work, right? Because I think before we didn't have this chance to meet uh, all the uh, all the campus and uh, hear the different area, what they doing and that's what they, they have. So we really appreciate that. And uh, we, we really appreciate the virtual uh, opportunity we got. So my point is uh, like, uh, we learn a lot from the uh, in month we stay home. And uh, I believe uh, we like, um, this thing get the opportunity to, uh, adjust ourselves on the work uh, uh, style and uh, our like uh, I think we heard that uh, appreciation from all the managers and directors uh, for how how fast we adjust ourselves as an employee and uh, we uh, how much also the university saved uh, like supplies uh, and utility because we got this all of this from our side. So um, I believe the university now it has to show their appreciation right to just give us uh, this save to our life, not just to just the money wise, but at least to hear our voice for relieve some stress from traffic. For me, I like live so far 
and uh, I drive in the morning one hour and on night on evening two hours. So three hours of the stress of driving. And uh, you ask me to go back to work from home when that happened, when the pandemic happened. And now on one day, you ask me to just come back. And you never like uh, ask uh, our opinion we, or like uh, uh, what, what our needs. So I would love to just give us this opportunity to give some flexibility. And as you trust us as an employee to work 16 months, and you thank us for that because we show responsibility, we show like accountability. So I believe this is a university turning now to show this trust to us. And it's like kind of the management, the, if they want to like manage our work, I believe the, the, this is their side now to do with that, so not ours, because we already showed our, our style of, life, of work. So I believe that management is, needs to look at their portion now to how to manage us from home, not uh, to just make us come back to the campus. Uh, so they need to look our, to the stress from uh, working uh, like uh, driving and uh, stuck on traffic and uh, all of that and uh, uh, to just like uh, how this is gonna benefit our family to stay with them and uh, like we have like I have two teenagers with me and like uh, uh, for our health too it just this is the like uh, point so we need to hear it from the university thank you Hala, thank you very much. Another shout out for this Zoom technology and also a shout out to your colleagues. You're saying we are all so adaptable. We turned on a dime and we did it well. And then these other two words you brought up, appreciation and trust. And I think we've heard um, both of those themes also in terms of um, employees wanting to be shown appreciation and trust in a way that resonates with them. So thank you for sharing what that means um, for you. Next, we have Catherine. Unmute. Hi. Um, I wanted to stress the lessons we have learned that in my department in the College of Arts and Sciences, we realized we can be just as productive, if not more, working from home. And we, we realized how creative some of our people are. We realized that people get tired of Zoom meetings. And one of our employees went out and found a brand new platform. We had to go through the admissions process for new students. And how do we do that without meeting in person? So really shout out to technology again and creative people that are trying to do their best. So in some ways I do agree we've been more productive, but at the, yet time, at the same time, it's been stressful. Um, not having all the equipment at home that we do in the office. Um, but it has shine, shown a light on work-life balance. You take away that commute time and boy, you can, you know, be more productive in your home and your work place, you know, work from your pajamas. <laughs> um, but I, one thing we've learned is savings in this budget crisis is we can have guest speakers and reach a broader audience, not have to pay them to fly in. We can have international speakers who are banned from the country at present and still carry on our research and our professional um, endeavors. So that's been a big bonus. Um, I, I do agree that the bus options do need to be worked out. Hopefully Chapel Hill Transit and the other lines will come back to normal once the people come back, but they're probably having the same employment problems with getting people to work or, you know, finding people to work as other industries. But I think that's a big equitable issue the university has to take a look at because many, many employees use the bus options. And in my call to action, I would, hope that the university would give each major 
operating unit and the deans and the department chairs in those units, their own decision-making on what is best for their units, for their departments. They know who can work productively at home, who has to be back in the office for customer service. We know, you know parents are gonna want their kids they're paying the tuition, they want to, their children to have the services that they're paying for. But I think each department knows the right customer service, who has to be in person and who can be at home and they can submit their own plans on how they're gonna meet those customer needs. Thank you, Catherine. And so that was just, I hope that you were taking that in. That's um, a lot and all very valuable. I, one thing I wanna note is that you highlighted accessibility to each other and to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the tools, you questions about where decision making should lie, um, costs again, and then a bit of a, a mixed perspective on the things that have been challenging and the lessons that have also been positive around creativity um, in these times. And so I, I want to thank you, Catherine. I also want to say just that it's fine, whatever, whatever thoughts, opinions, ideas that you have to share, I want you to share them even if they're mixed and even if you aren't entirely clear on what it is you're feeling, this is a time to speak um, from wherever you are right now. So having said that, yes, thank you. Having said that, um, Laura, I'm gonna ask you to give a little visibility into what's happening with the Q&A and then we'll take just a minute and put a pin in things, Shana, for you to talk um, about what we're doing here for people who just joined. Hey everyone, my name is Laura Pratt and I am an employee forum delegate. I am so thrilled to see so many of you here and the Q&A function is just going crazy. It's terrific to see that we have almost 180 comments and questions and please know that the forum delegates are taking all of those and they will be included in the report. Um, so I wanna give a little bit of visibility to some common themes that I'm seeing come up in the Q&A, as well as common themes that we've seen so far um, in our survey responses. Some of these you'll hear as overlaps, um, but I'll try not to, to repeat too much. Um, I do want to draw attention to some staffing matters that have been shared. Um, so someone said, losing my staff to other employers who are continuing to provide flexible work arrangements. Um, that's a very real concern. And someone uh, shared some more information specifically about Apple and Google coming into the triangle. They pay more and also promote a hybrid or working remote working schedule for their staff. So that's definitely um, a lesson learned in terms of staffing. I think we've really uh, heard quite a bit about the productivity being up, uh, but someone did share that they miss working with their colleagues. You know, there's that community building aspect that we're gonna talk about more in our second hour, but wanna give that as a little teaser, a lesson learned is that they miss their colleagues. Um, Another comment that I would like to share are, are about the broader impacts. You know, we've talked a lot about commuting, the environment, um, but certainly some financial savings. Um, in addition to other comments, reflexibility of work, I liked saving money on gas and parking. The three day week parking option was perfect for me and my staff. So we have definitely received questions about parking. We will be uh, working with parking to help get some more visibility and clarity about what that parking will look like in the fall semester. And then um, I think this is a, another comment here. Uh, lessons learned. A lengthy commute is exhausting and has a toll on mental health and physical health. UNC's IT department has the talent to support remote work. Yes, so many kudos to UNC's IT department. Uh, UNC staff rises to the challenge. Absolutely, I think we've seen that and have heard of that. And then I have had wonderful moments of collaboration through technology tools. So one final comment that I would like to share are um, some nods to the financial parts of lessons learned. Um, so I'll read these verbatim. Salaries at UNC are well below industry standard, at least for my role. And there is an industry-wide shift towards remote work following the pandemic. If UNC can't compete on salary or work-life balance, then what is the plan? We already have 
We are already having a problem getting qualified staff here, and it follows that we won't be able to replace existing staff. Another person says, very simple. UNC says they don't have the budget to increase, they don't have budget to increase to market salaries, then allow us to stay home and save some money we do currently own, please. So thank you all for sharing your takeaways. Um, and I will turn it over to Shana now. Hi, everybody. Um, we thought it would be a good idea at the halfway mark just to give you some reminders about process in the meeting today in case you have joined us late. And I'm thrilled to see that almost 500 people uh, have attended today and are continuing to attend. So just a couple of reminders. Today's meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our website so that it is accessible to those who are not able to attend. Additionally, the ideas discussed today will be included in a written report provided to administration. The report will also incorporate your responses from the survey we sent out with the link to register to this event. We will try to get to as many people as we can today, but if you are unable to share your thoughts with us during the meeting, please be sure to complete the survey. Some procedures to note today, we have disabled the chat and are relying on the Q&A feature and the raise your hand feature. If you wish to remain anonymous, you can choose the anonymous option in the Q&A. If you wish to display your name in the Q&A, that option is also available. Please note that things posted in the Q&A are visible to all participants and attendees. Again, please do not pose questions in the Q&A as we have no panelists, but rather share your ideas or concerns with us so that we may incorporate them into the report. If you would like to be recognized and share your thoughts or concerns on camera, please use the raise your hand feature and you will be invited to speak. And I turn it back over to Dawn. Thank you, Shana, and thank you, Laura. And for those of you who have joined us um, in the second hour, welcome. And please, you know, step out there and contribute your voice to this container. I said in the first hour, we're building this container that can hold anything you want to put in it. So we invite you to throw some things in. We're gonna to move to the third question. And we've touched a little bit on this and it'll be interesting to see if others have um, things to add. The third question is how would you like to see the lessons learned applied to the future? And we've already heard some comments. Are there others out there who wanna build on what's already been said or add something new? And so George, I see your hand is up. Are you gonna pop up at any second? There we go, hi. Uh, you can tell I'm probably pretty passionate about this at this point. Um, I, you know, the one thing, and I, I do wanna build kind of on, I think what, um, I think Dennis had brought this up, but I think there's clearly a need for compassionate decision-making when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, this is, this policy from HR is very draconian, in my opinion. I think that the uh, need to work five days a week should be a choice that an individual makes, um, as long as it is in accordance with what their office is putting forward. You know, our office, uh, all of the managers in my office wanted a flexible working policy. They wanted to do something where it was three days in, two days remote. That's something that I would be totally grateful to be able to, um, uh, you know, that, that'd be a great way to be able to perform my work. But because of this roadblock, none of that is possible now. So I think with these lessons word, we need realistic and compassionate decision making in, in these policies and not something that is, is uh, you know, a one size fits all approach. So I hear compassionate, realistic, and individualized decision-making as yes. we apply the lessons learned. And I also want to say you don't have to apologize for being passionate. <laughs> One of the, um, I think, most important points we can make about a community is dissent, is care. And I take that from a book that I've been evangelizing about all over campus. But when people dissent, it's because they care deeply about what's going on around them. And that the opposite of that would be disengaging. So don't, don't apologize for being passionate. We appreciate you. Thanks, Don. Yep, thank you. And I saw another hand, but I didn't get the name. It's disappeared from that. That would be Melody Snow. Okay, Melody. 
Are you with us? Hi, I started to, um, thank you for acknowledging me. I started to put my comment in the Q and A, but then I realized I needed to do more explanation. Okay. So okay. to me, it sounds like the university is open. I'm in School of Medicine, Limeburger Cancer Center. And it sounds to me that the university is open to the departments creating their own, at least School of Medicine, creating their own concept for what um, returning to a physical office will look like. Um, but I think that what, what's not being uh, acknowledged or what's not being taken into consideration it are the individual faculty and staff members and what um, they've been able to accomplish while working remotely. So, uh, you know, in my opinion, a survey, somebody should create a survey that goes out to faculty, staff, and managers. So the manager survey would need to look different to get their perception of how their team has functioned during the pandemic. But then for faculty and staff also to complete, recognizing again that faculty have different needs than staff does, like students. So I would imagine that these would be different surveys for the three groups. But to give us a chance to talk about um, or to answer questions about our concerns going returning to a physical office, but also for us to explain or, or answer questions about our effective and efficient our effectiveness and efficiency while we've been working remotely. Because I think, you know, I'm about to sound ageist, and that's not what I'm saying at all. I think that there are um, there's a, a, a way of operating for um, folks who've been in management for you know, 20, 30 years who feel like they need to set eyes on their employees every day. And I, I don't wanna say that they're micromanaging, it's just what they're used to. You know? And, and um, our group has morning calls. We get on Zoom every morning. So our supervisor can set her eyes on our face every morning and we can talk to her. So we're having this forum and it's great. And I feel like only the managers have been able to, or the, the different school deans have been able to put in their piece that goes to someone who matters. So I feel like we need to be able to fill out surveys and things like that to talk about our side of the situation. So Melody, thank you. You are 100% correct. No comment in the Q&A could have done the same as you just did through your own voice speaking. So thank you for being willing to do that. Um, and thank you for the suggestion about a survey to faculty, staff, and managers to really collect more data on lots of things, efficiency, productivity, um, concerns, et cetera. And um, for also highlighting, I didn't hear it as ages. I heard you saying there's different generations in the workforce who may have different approaches to work. And I think that's real and that's something to throw into the container. So thank you. Arlene, I see your hand up and I don't know if it's to speak, is it? It is. Okay, wonderful. Um, something I'd like a lesson to move forward, I guess, is mask use. Because even without a pandemic, being able to wear a mask helps people with allergies and people who have a cold prevent them from either getting infected by contaminants or from infecting other people, even when it's something mild. So I'd like to see widespread mask use and hand washing. That's good encouragement. Widespread hand, widespread mask use and hand washing, encouraging um, the community to engage in those things. Thank you for that comment. Any other thoughts about lessons, how to, how to apply the lessons that have been learned? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna turn to Ellie to um, tell us about what's in the Q&A. Thanks, Don. Hi all, my name is Ellie Alexander. I'm an employee forum delegate. Thank you all for coming today and voicing your concerns. Um, a few things in the chat that I'd like to highlight um, that have been upvoted quite a few times. 
Um, someone mentioned that they have been working remotely since March of 2020, and my whole life has been restructured to fit that flexibility. I am worried that we will be required to return to the office either full-time or part-time, and it will completely upset this new balance I have in my life. This flexibility has been amazing for both my mental and physical health. And I'm very worried I will lose that if I'm required to return to the office. Um, another individual mentioned that they agree um, that the university pulling employees and or supervisors to determine what will be best for their office is important. My office is student facing, yet we have the data that supports us continuing to provide our, our services virtually. The data we have collected from students since last March specifically ask them about their virtual experience and 95% prefer a virtual experience and they offered valuable insights as to why. Um, another comment, I think of it as preparing for a marathon. We have been in isolation for over a year, having very little contact with family, friends and the broader community. As you would train for a marathon, the right thing to do is to train, ease, or transition your employees for such level of social interaction and exposure to students and other employees and closely monitoring that transition. But instead, we're expected to run the marathon without any support or resources, without any training, to go back to the metaphor. I personally have found that perfect work-life balance is a hybrid, which is a totally different subject that I think should be decided via departmental level. And I wanna point out a couple things mentioned in the um, survey collected prior to the town hall. Uh, a few employees on question number, on this question, really referencing mental health and mental health needing to be at the forefront of decisions in the future. Um, and that was something that, that came up. And also um, a few people referencing vaccine policies being important. Thank you, Ellie. And we didn't plan this, but again, that's the perfect segue to the fourth, um, to the fourth question. And the fourth question is this, you know, really looking forward question about kind of, you know, hopes and needs. In what ways can we celebrate a healthy return to campus and rebuild our in-person community? So Don, I would like to start that one off. Okay, um, please. I have heard from several people from all, all areas of campus that we need to acknowledge what we've been through together. Um, that seems to be the place to start. And many people have lost a great many things. And, and I will share my personal experience on Friday. It will be the one year anniversary of my husband losing his mother. And she died alone in a facility and we were unable to visit her. Um, and given everything that was going on in my work life, I stood in the graveyard with no one present answering work emails because that's what was required of both my life and my work at the time. And I'm not alone. There are a lot of people that have had traumatic experiences. I have heard from many people um, that they were caring for people with COVID while working in their kitchens. Um, and the fear and the anxiety that we've all experienced together, regardless of what our experiences initially individually were, is, is profound. And I think some of the reaction that I'm hearing when people are asked to turn on a dime and, and return to what is being called normal um, feels disingenuous. And it feels like it doesn't honor this journey that we've been on for the past 15 months. So I, I, I didn't want this to, um, this opportunity to pass me by without saying, I think there are a lot of people that are carrying a great burden and 
we need to we need to have care around that. We need to have grace and we need to be generous about our expectations with each other and we need to be flexible. And we need to embrace the pain that that we may encounter when we start interacting with our colleagues again. Thank you, Shana. I love the phrase honoring the journey that we've all been on in the specific ways that you identify that we can all do that. Thank you for starting this off. Others who want to speak into this question? We have some hands up on the panel. Okay, I don't know if I can see. So I see Kay Jones, but I don't know what the first name is, and then Tiffany. Hi, everyone, it's Kira. Um, I just wanted to thank Gina for what she just said, because that's the place that I am sitting in as I think through not only a return to campus for myself, but also my colleagues and staff in other areas of campus, because the thing that I keep coming back to and that I'm really hoping that the university and in general and departments specifically are mindful of is that we have, as you know, you're saying, lived through a traumatic experience. Um, and that trauma looks different for each one of us. But the need to process the trauma is there for all of us. And you can't process trauma when you're living in it. So the idea that we're being asked to ramp up to very quickly to eight hours a day, five days a week, doesn't give us the mental space to take maybe the breaks that we've been taking to sort of deal with what we've been dealing with over this last year. And I think the expectation that we quote unquote return to normal is, I think someone said earlier is problematic language, really is missing the reality of, of our lived experiences in the current state of all of our mental health and well being. And so I think there needs to be more than just a sort of rhetorical lip service to this care and concern about mental health and well being, which we keep hearing, and that's great, but actually rubber meeting the road action that allows and creates space for people to take the time that they need as they transition back on campus into these jobs, which we've been doing, trying to do in this stressed sort of traumatic experience we've all been living in. So I think a mindfulness of that and really an implementation of that, not just a mindfulness of it, um, is what needs to needs to be considered moving forward. Thank you. And did you say your first name is Kira? Kira, yep. Kira, thank you. So another, you know, action oriented implementation, uh, implementation and highlighting trauma and also transition period. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Tiffany. Hey, I'm Tiffany Carver, Secretary of the Employee Forum. Um, and I just wanted to say it's it's to answer the question or try to answer the question, it's kind of hard to get excited about returning to campus um, without feeling the support that we need from leadership. Um, me personally, and I've said this multiple times, I get very anxious when thinking about returning to campus because not all of us just deal with students, faculty, and staff. We deal with people from the general public. We are a public institution. There are people who come to campus who want to tour our buildings and who want to ask questions about our programs. And so we have this certain level of expectation as far as behavior is concerned regarding faculty, staff, and students. But what about the general public? And how do we interact with the general public in a way that we're comfortable with? Um, you know, we want to feel safe in our offices, in our buildings. Um, but we can't, we can't say or do but so many things and still be professional and still you know, do our jobs in, a, in the way that is expected of us. So I feel like there needs to be some kind of uh, reassurance that there's support for those of us who do have to deal with the general public um, and that the university has our backs and that they are thinking of those of us who have to deal with the general public and not just student faculty um, and other staff. Um, so to me, it would be better. It would it would feel better. I would be more excited about returning if I didn't feel like we were just being pushed back onto campus 
on July 19th. Um, like others have stated, no more of a staggered return and see how we are interfacing with each other and with the public um, before just kind of tossing us all back and saying, okay, let's see how it works. Like that just seems very backwards to me, but also very unsafe and unsettling. So I don't know if other people feel that way, but me personally, that's where a lot of my anxiety um, comes from. And it makes me hard. It makes it hard to get excited to return. I am excited to be amongst my coworkers. I do enjoy being around them um, and students, but I'm also scared um, and very anxious about how those interactions will be. Thank you, Tiffany, for um, kind of highlighting what you need before you can feel excited that you need these basic needs taken care of. And also this other um, this other comment about navigating engagement with the with the general public that I don't think we've heard until now. Jacob. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and, and take advantage of the fact that I'm already a panelist. Thank um, you. I didn't see your hand. I'm sorry. No, it's quite all right. It, yeah. it probably, it, me and computers. I um, thought everybody else was going to make some mistakes with this technology. I'm just making good on my word. That's all. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've been in rapture with the, with the Q&A session, so I've been reading a whole lot of stuff, especially to my instinct is to read the stuff that doesn't get upvoted as much. Um, just because I'm always worried about outliers or opinions that aren't as popular or things that fall through the cracks. I'm always paranoid that we might miss something like that. Um, and as a, as a member who works in facilities, I've been back full time for 40 hours a week since June of last year. I've, I've spent more time working at this university in person when no one was here than I did in person when people were here. Um, and I also talked to a bunch of other people that are in this field. And so there's there's a little bit of there is developing what it seems to me, and this is very, I think, is going to be necessary to, to bring forward uh, coming back to campus, is we're going to have to rebuild trust. It's been lost in a lot of directions. It's not just employees versus administration. It's employee to employee. There are, people, there are multiple comments in the QA about vaccine status discrimination, concerns about if you're going to get paid more or less over the, there's just why some units are being treated different than others, why is the School of Medicine so far ahead of everybody in the pilot program, why are some people, and it, it's, and this has been kind of indicative of the problem for over a year, is there has been this kind of continual erosion of trust. Um, I wish I had a lovely solution about how to do trust building exercises with 8,000 employees. I don't think a trust fall that big is safe, but I, we do need some way of, of bringing that back. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's gonna be tantamount to, to success to actually get everybody to, to at least trust that we're all kind of working towards the same goals and the same ends, because I, I worry that that's been eroded. So that word trust again, Jacob, thank you for that. And so I'm gonna put you on the spot and you feel free to pass, but you're right about the size of that trust fall, 1,000%. But what about in smaller, Group, since the way that we experience our work life is really in the unit, um, do you have thoughts about what builds trust in the smaller group? Oh, certainly. I mean, I, I think I think that's also goes back to a point that a lot of people have been making that you need to allow the units to lead in that in that responsibility. That each in, each individual unit understands what they do better than anybody else. They are they are the experts in that field. So to allow them to 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 to, to give trust to get trust, I think is a very important first step. Um, to allow people to 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 lead, um, to because I think a lot of people feel that the remote policy is being driven by a lack of trust. That you know, if we're not here, how do they know we're working? If they can't pop into our office, how do they know we're getting things done? Um, and again, I think that that trust that concern is ubiquitous throughout different divisions. But I think by allowing that, I think that's a great first step is by allowing the units to kind of create that. That is that is that is showing a sign of trust that is saying, hey, we believe in you. And then, you know, if you can't do it, well, then we'll deal with it when that when that happens. But I, I think it, it has to be someone has to give it first. And I feel like the employees have been asked to give first for years and years and years in a row. And so many people are exhausted that it's that it's going to be difficult to to once again be the first one to trust. Thank you, Jacob. That's a, thank you for being willing to do that on the spot. Um, the, re the reciprocity of it, the give and take, and I love that you said somebody has to be willing to give it first. 
a hard thing. Mandy Melton is next. I just wanted to touch about building trust in my department. One of the ways we do that is events. And we've done that for a long time. And obviously we haven't done that for the last 16 months. Um, and we've been trying to figure out how we're going to do these things without a budget. Um, because currently using money is restricted for, for certain things and we can't do what we used to do with, with the funds. And I don't know how we can build trust without without support to build the trust like it's um i feel like we we've stayed in a position of can't can't move forward but we've got to move forward and i don't know how to reconcile those things mm -hmm. so you're saying trust building costs money because it's one of the ways to build trust is to bring people together and that there's a financial piece to that. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Mandy. Any other comments, ideas, suggestions, concerns? Okay, so I don't know what the R is for. You have to help me. Arbor. It's Randall. Randall. Um, first, after after Randall, then we have Audrey Shore. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Okay. So am I on? Yes, you're on, Randall. Okay. Okay. Great. So uh, just going um, just going along with the theme of the question, healthy and and rebuilding. Um, you know, I, I share a lot of the concerns that that were mentioned earlier the ones that resonate most with me are the public transportation i take public transportation and that when it's no longer possible to six sit six feet away from somebody is that how safe is that um you know i i also feel like i've spent more hours working and been more pro productive from home I, I am worried about people leaving and i think it's going to be inevitable with change that there's going to be some people leaving but we'd love to minimize the amount of that that happens. And, you know, the, I resonate a lot with the comments about the ability for more localized decision making. It's really hard to say one size fits all. Um, but I also, I also um, think that um, we ourselves can, can do more. Um, we meaning those who aren't necessarily at the top making decisions. I think we ourselves can, can also help do more um, in terms of rebuilding I, you know, I appreciate a lot of people have shared a lot of feelings and, and, and feelings certainly are valid, um, but we, we have to distinguish, I think, between what it feels like and not draw conclusions that, um, that we're not sure are true. I, I, it really, I really cringe when I hear people say administration doesn't care because when I look at all the communications on the websites and when I look at um, all the meetings and the people in administration and in leadership positions have been a part of, and the comments I've heard, I, I really, I really cringe when I hear people say that because I really don't think that's true. And I've seen a lot of evidence that that's true and that that, that that's not true, that they do care. Um, also, the trust issue is a tough one. Uh, I know it feels like if you're being told you can no longer work from home, I know it feels like maybe you're not being trusted, but there are a lot of factors that go into um, decisions about whether you can work from home or not, or whether people need to be on site or not. And trust isn't always the main um, factor when it comes to your people who are supporting faculty or supporting centers or functions. Uh, I, I happen to belong to the School of Medicine and um, our faculty never left, not, not even in March when, you know, of 2020 when it, when it really hit the fan, um, they never left. So there's a lot of people that, that actually never left. And I think it was Jacob said, you know, they, a lot of other people came back a long time ago. Um, but I think we also need to realize, I, I appreciate all the people who've said, there's a lot of people, I've heard it not just in this meeting, but other places, um, commenting, I'm more productive from home. And I personally feel that way myself. I feel like I've worked more hours from home. On days when I am working from home, I'm in the office today, but on days when I am working from home, I start earlier, I finish later. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more productive in, in a number of ways, but I think we need to realize that 
that's not true for everybody. There are some people for whom working from home is a real struggle and it really helps some people to actually be in the office and, and be more productive uh, in that way. And of course that can also depend on role, personality and all kinds of other things. Um, and I think we just need to understand it. The, the leaders who are making decisions um, have a lot, a lot of factors to weigh in, stakeholders and, and competing interests and, and all kinds of things. One of the, one of the ones was uh, somebody mentioned earlier, parents who are sending their kids to school and expecting them to get as close to the same experience as they would have two years ago. Um, that, that's, that's just one of many competing factors. And I think we just need to understand that. So I just want to encourage people when we talk about rebuilding, I think there are things we can do on the ground level that, that help that rebuilding. Um, yeah, there's been an edict saying, come back and everybody comes back in July, but I don't necessarily think that's the end of the conversation. And I think that um, it, it, it's been mentioned in the chat that there are some leaders in administration on this call. So they're hearing these comments. Shana has mentioned that, that this, a lot of this, all this feedback is gonna be sent to them. Um, I don't know that July is the end of the road. I don't know that this July 17th, that we don't still have the opportunity to continue to evolve beyond July 17th. And um, I think there are ways that you can help your leadership understand you know, if you haven't made that comment to them already, hey, guess what? I've actually been more productive from home or, um, you know, we, we in, yeah, I'm in the School of Medicine. So I've, we've, a lot of us have been in the office at least somewhat. And we ran into a challenge at one point where we had some folks that felt like the working from home wasn't working. And when, as we looked into it more, we realized that people not being visible was a problem, but if we communicated schedules about who was gonna be in the office and when they were gonna be in the office, that really helped resolve a lot of the concerns. And so it wasn't necessarily that people needed to come back to the office five days a week. It was just that we needed to communicate who was there when and who they could go to if they really needed something on site in person, who they could go to when their first point of contact wasn't in the office that day. Um, and I just I get concerned about, you know, I, I, I'm also very concerned with mental health. I was before COVID. Um, I still am. Um, you know, I think that um, our own healthy understanding, we, you know, acknowledge your feelings and, and, and what it feels like to you, but, but don't necessarily draw conclusions and try to help spread understanding to your leaders and to your coworkers that really help promote a healthier and more accurate perspective for all of us. So thank you for those comments. I wanna just um, kind of summarize what I think I heard you say is um, one point is about the agency of individuals that we all as members of this community have the power to impact it. Another point you made was about inferences and um, needing to kind of check it out and get more information before we name what we believe others intentions are. Uh, another point is a call to action for compassion for all and understanding for all, including those who have led us and are leading us through this. And then finally, this idea of evolution and that this is the beginning of a very long conversation through which com communication will be key. Did I get it? Yeah, no, that, that was great. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you very much. There was a lot in what you said. Next up, we have Tracy. I think we had Audrey. So, oh, next, oh, that's next right, that's we right. have the lovely Audrey Shore. Hi, Keith. Hey. Um, so backstory, I am a UNC alum for grad school. I worked at UNC. I left because of, in part, the lack of flexibility and the rigidity of the system. Um, I am very lucky to have gotten a job during COVID, and I am back at UNC. I adore my supervisor and the team I work with, um, but I don't understand how we will build trust at a macro level with people at like the vice chancellor, the chancellor and the board of governors level. Um, I just don't see that, like it seems like a class issue and access to information. Like we are not, like this is wonderful. I feel very connected to my colleagues and my peers at UNC but I wouldn't count the chancellor and the board of governors as my peers. And I don't know how much of this they are receiving and how much of it they are receptive to. 
So that's where the trust comes in because we can talk about this for hours and weeks, but if it's not being received, then I don't see how anything's going to change. And we're just gonna go back to the rigid structure. Like the idea that fall is supposed to be more rigid and then just to relax in the spring, that to me seems like a way to just wear us down further until we're not arguing about getting remote work again in the spring because we've all just endured the fall. Um, so I don't know how trust is built at this point, um, not to be super negative, but I feel really supported and positive after this, knowing that a lot of people are in the same boat as me and I feel very heard and I hope that other folks feel heard at a peer level. At an institutional level, I feel very much ignored. Um, and that stinks as an alum and a for current and former employee. Like on many levels, I want to trust UNC. And on many levels, I am unable to based on leadership far above me and far above my pay grade who are making decisions on what a middle-class wage earner should be expected to do. Um, so that's all I've got. No, that's enough. Um, and it's not negative, it's real. And this, this idea of the, um, you know, the distance to traverse between the very top of an organization and those who are at the broader part, I think is incredibly hard to build trust between those two places. I, I'm gonna ask you this and you feel free to say, Dawn, I'm not answering this. Um, to me, it seems like there's a, you know, there would be some sign, right? There would be some sign to you of um, you've, you've heard me. What would that be, even if it was very small? I mean, rescinding the July 19th mandate, that feels incredibly rushed. Um, the fact that we are having this forum less than a month from our start date. And there's an expect expectation that in the less than four weeks between now and the start date, the folks that make the decisions are gonna review all of this and take in our feedback seems highly unrealistic. Um, so that would be the simplest answer is to rescind that start date and actually do something different. Um, because I just don't know how in three weeks with the leadership we have who can't make decisions quickly in general, how we can trust them to make a decision that affects 8,000 employees unilaterally. Understood, thank you. So next is Tracy. And then after Tracy, I think we should hear from you, Katie, about what's in the Q&A and then we should wrap up so that we um, do our best to end on time. Tracy? Um, I, uh, yes, this is, I'm Tracy Weatherby Williams. I'm the treasurer um, of the employee forum. And um, just, I'm, I'm encouraged how many people are engaged in this conversation. Um, and I, I, I think I have a couple of just comments and it reiterates some of what was already said, but hopefully defines it a little bit better. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that one size does not fit all in this situation. That's, that's something that we keep hearing over and over again. And I think that's one of the biggest frustrations I keep hearing over and over again from this discussion. Um, you know, we could, I believe that trust could be begun to be built by the administration if they listen and be receptive to giving units the agency to evaluate how their units would best, um, best be effective in their jobs. Um, and, and like the last comment that was made, not just this is a hard, fast date, it's a let's back up and let's evaluate this again. Um, again, I agree that this does feel very rushed and, and the reason why this discussion is only happening a month before um, <laughs> the, the, the date is that it, it took some time to get, put this together by the forum um, because we were also um, informed the same time that everybody else was of the back to work date. Um, so that all being said, um, the action is let's sit down, let's write up this report, let's make sure the administrators see it and hear it and, and listen to us. Thank you, Tracy. And so now, um... Katie, you want to share what's in the Q and A on this last fourth, this fourth question? Okay, thank you, Don. I'm Katie Musgrove. I am the chair elect of the Employee Forum, and I want to echo everybody's 
thanks to all of you for participating today. I think this is really, really important for all of us to hear um, your feedback, your thoughts, your concerns. So we really appreciate you you meeting us here and, and helping us in this in this way. Um, I, I want to also reiterate there's there's been over 275 responses in the Q&A. All of this is going to be saved and, and utilized when we develop this report to the administration. So um, even though we, we may not have gotten to all of you in the Q&A, your, your thoughts have been heard, so thank you. Um, just a few final ones to echo, um, and I'll read a few. Um, as much as I understand the need for the leaders of UNC to want everyone to return to campus, I agree wholeheartedly that we have been doing these roles for 15 months which was something initially was thought to be impossible. We have known that it can be done and why cannot we continue to work from home or with a hybrid schedule, especially where UNC is not requiring everyone to be vaccinated. That just seems reckless. Um, another is I get that the university doesn't want the campus to be a ghost town with students just roaming around and no staff or faculty there to support them. So if students will be required to be on campus, then the logic from the university is that everyone else needs to be there too not necessarily true. There can be a hybrid model. It ultimately comes down to the fact that the university is underpaying most staff anyway. So the flexibility during COVID-19 at least gives some of us psychological wage benefit to keep us engaged. But it does cost staff more to go to the office since we have to pay for parking and it's not like university employees get performance bonuses or stock options like their corporate counterparts. Um, and then finally, departments are learning about the pilot inconsistently. Um, some are hearing not, no decisions have been made while departments on campus have already indicated they are part of the pilot and will remain fully remote. It is frustrating for departmental leadership not to have concrete information to give our teams and to consistently feel like guidance is shifting day to day. I agree with others here, we shouldn't go backwards in the decision to require full return to campus is a motivator for our best staff to explore other opportunities. We are losing staff and I know that, I know of staff who are looking elsewhere because of the mandatory return to campus. Um, and just a few final things kind of themes echoed um, in some responses to the survey that we sent out beforehand. Um, there's just kind of some themes around creating an authentic um, inclusive space um, for discussion of trauma, stress and accountability in regards to kind of how to kind of rebuild our campus in-person community. Um, and then there's also themes around kind of the community dealing with the stress of the transition and the trauma of the past year and wanting to focus on that and avoid large gatherings where there seems to be a lot of anxiety surrounding that. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Dawn. I appreciate it. You got all your help. Thank you, Katie. So I think that we have reached the end of the facilitated portion. I'm going to turn it back over to Shane and I'm just going to say thank you to everyone for being willing to fill the container and being willing to speak up, um, whether it's in the Q&A or have your voice heard or to be on screen, all of it is valuable. And as I said at the beginning, it takes a lot of courage to speak up in a big meeting. And um, I appreciate all of you. And I just ask that any transgressions that I've made, if I didn't say your name right, if I didn't you know, make the right comment to what you said, I ask you to give me, you know, a little bit of extra grace on that and know that I do appreciate everybody who's participated today. And thank you to the forum for letting me act in this role. Shana, you take it from here. Great. I just want to reiterate my thanks to everybody who came on today and shared their thoughts. The employee forum, um, our mission is to actively uh, seek out concerns and address them constructively with administration. So we can't do that without hearing from you. So thank you very much for your, um, your candor, your honesty, and your courage for coming and sharing with us today. I would be remiss if I didn't give a heartfelt thanks to Don Osborne Adams, who um, blows me away every time I work with her. So many, many thanks. And also to the technical team here, I just have to say Keith Hines, Jacob Womack, Laura Pratt, Katie Musgrove, Stephanie Foreman, Kevin Robinson, Tiffany Carver, and Ellie Alexander, you are amazing. You are my heroes and my sheroes. So thank you very much for making today happen. Um, I leave you with, please take care of one another. Please treat each other with kindness and grace. And thank you for being here today. One last quick thank you. 
um, to David Sperling for doing our closed captioning today. Uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> thank you, David. Thank you everybody for coming. Have a great day. <laughs>